Thank you, Joanna, and good morning, Redeemer. It is great to be with you, uh, even as we say some exciting yet sad farewells. Uh, Dave had five points, Eric was at 17. I, I've just got one thing to say. One, as I think about even Scott and Angela, as I even think about many friends who over these coming weeks and months are, are moving countries. I think of Jesus' words uh, in John 16, 33. I've said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Friends, I share that uh, today uh, with, with some of my friends, yet if we were to ask, I think Gideon, today's judge what his verse would be, what his memory verse would be, if he had the New Testament, I think Gideon would choose that same verse. Uh, Today, uh, similar to last week, we're going to work quite quickly through these passages. We're going to read through, just with a few comments, uh, this part of Gideon's life. If we think about the, uh, the cycle, the judge's cycle, We won't see quite a whole cycle today because we're going to stop like halfway through Gideon's life um, and we'll finish his story next week. But as we work through this part of Gideon's life, I think we will see one central theme. We'll see a man who moves from fear to faith. We'll see a man who finds peace in the Lord. That's why I think he would choose John 16, 33 as well. Uh, Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you speak to us. Thank you that Jesus has told us things. Thank you that Jesus spoke. He revealed you to us. And thank you that in him we can have peace because he has overcome the world. Please show us yourself more clearly. Please give us peace. Uh, in Jesus, our Saviour. It's in His good and great name that we pray. Amen. Friends, please have your Bibles open there, whether on your device, uh, there in your Bible, uh, as we work through this, this story, chapter 6 and 7, which we will see is about one thing, moving from fear to faith. Joanna read, we heard that the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Uh, The Lord gave them into the hand of Midian seven years. But then we're told just how fearful their situation became. Uh, Most times when we've heard that the Lord gave His people over, we get one verse telling us that they were oppressed or they had a hard time. But here we've got detail after detail telling us how fearful their lives had become. Uh, We're told in verse 2 that the hand of Midian overpowered Israel and because of Midian, the people of Israel made for themselves dens that are in the mountains and caves and the strongholds. Things were so bad for the Israelites that they could no longer live in their houses or the towns. They needed to go and hide in caves, hide in the mountains. Things were bad. We're told that uh, whenever they planted crops, they did that in fear, knowing that before they ever got to enjoy those crops, the Midianites would come in and steal everything, leaving nothing for them and their families to eat. The Israelites had had all of their, uh, their sheep, their oxen, their donkeys taken away. Life was bad. We were told the people of Israel in verse 6 were brought very low because of Midian. Midian seemed like a swarm of locusts. You couldn't count them. You couldn't count their camels. They just seemed undefeatable. God's people were in fear. We're told in verse 6, they cried out for help to the Lord. And when the people of Israel cried out to the Lord on account of the Midianites, well, the Lord this time doesn't yet send a judge, He sends a prophet. God doesn't first send salvation, He sends a messenger. 
He doesn't lift them out yet of this this situation, he gives them a lecture. Uh, The Lord sent a prophet and he said to them, thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, I led you up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of slavery and I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of all who oppressed you and drove them out before you and gave them into your hand. And I said to you, I am the Lord your God. You shall not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. God's people have been brought low. They're terrified of their circumstances. They're terrified of the Midianites. They're hiding in caves. They're starving. Yet God comes to them and says, you need to realize something important. The Midianites are not what you should fear. Your greatest problem is not the Midianites or starvation. Your your greatest problem is actually before me. You feared them and you've not feared me. You have feared them and you have not obeyed my voice. It may not seem sensitive. God's, they're calling out for help and God tells them what's wrong, but God is telling them exactly what they need. They need to know that their greatest problem is no enemy, no starvation. Their greatest problem is their relationship with God. Until that is broken, everything will be broken. He says, you've not obeyed my voice. Don't fear them. You are to fear me. Does God point them to what is wrong? Does God point them to their part in their their situation? Well, God then does work to save. Look at verse 11. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat uh, under the terebinth at Ophrah. And the angel of the Lord uh, sees Gideon uh, beating out wheat in the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, the Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. Now I think that's actually meant to appear funny because Gideon at this point is def- definitely doesn't look like a mighty man of valor. When you're beating out wheat, the place you're meant to do it is actually elevated because you need the wind to come by and take the chaff of the wheat away as you beat it out. You're meant to beat out wheat in the open, even in an elevated place. And Gideon, like the rest of the Israelites, is deep in fear. He's doing it in a barrel, kind of underground. Definitely doesn't look like a mighty man of valour at this point. And we'll see that he doesn't feel like a mighty man of valor either. Verse 13, Gideon said, please, my Lord, the Lord's with us. Why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us, saying, did not the Lord bring us out from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of Midian. Gideon doesn't feel like a mighty man of valor. He's full of pain, anger, questions... But the Lord turns again to him and says, Go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do not I send you? Again, Gideon just like doesn't feel like he's up to it. Gideon doesn't have this might that God is speaking of. He says to him, Please, Lord, how can I save Israel? My clan's the weakest in Manasseh, and I'm the least in my father's house. But the Lord said to him, but I will be with you and you shall strike the Midianites as one man. God tells him three times, do not fear, I am with you. I'm going to use you to save. God does intend to save his people and he's going to do it, save his fearful people through this fearful man, Gideon. Yet Gideon still isn't convinced and asks for some proof, asks for a sign. God's promise three times enough wasn't wasn't enough. Uh, He says, if I've found favour in your eyes, you think God's just told him three times he does have favour, if I've found favour in your eyes, then show me a sign that it's you who speak to me. Please do not depart from here. 
And he sets up this sacrifice, puts it on a rock, and God's angel, no, without pushing back at all, says, sure thing. God's angel then sets the, the offering on fire. Uh, God actually gives him, in his mercy, a sign. And we're told then that Gideon then perceived that he was the angel of the Lord. And we see something change in Gideon. Where Gideon had been terrified of the Midianites, we see Gideon finds a new fear, a fear of God. Gideon perceived, verse 22, the angel of the Lord, and Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for now I've seen the angel of the Lord face to face. He realized that actually he shouldn't be fearing the Midianites. He shouldn't be fearing any anger or ra- any, any raider. He shouldn't be fearing hunger. He should fear God. And he's just met the angel of God face to face. Surely he's going to die. But the, the Lord said to him, Peace be to you. Do not fear. You shall not die. And Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it, the Lord is peace. Here we see the first step in Gideon's life in moving from fear to faith. He realized the Midianites, as terrible as they are, as powerful as they are, are not the thing he should fear most. He begins to fear God. And when he fears God, he finds that the Lord is peace. But with this newfound faith, uh, God is now going to use him. God is going to push Gideon to face some of his fears. We see that in verse 25. That night the Lord said to him, Take your father's bull, and the second bull seven years old, and pull down the altar of Baal that your father has, and cut down the Asher that's beside it, and build an altar to the Lord your God on top of the stronghold there, with stones laid in due order. Then take the second bull and offer it as a burnt offering with the wood of the Asherah that you shall cut down. So here we realise just how bad the situation is. When God was rebuking His people a few verses ago for fearing the gods of the nations, they really were worshipping the nations. Here are Israelites, here is Gideon's own father who set up an altar to the, the pagan god Baal. He set up an altar to this pagan fertility god. They're worshipping other gods. They really have feared the gods of the nations and not the true and living God. And God sends Gideon on a hard task. He says, go to your father's house. Take your father's own bull. Knock down his altar. And it's not something you can do quickly, just knock over the altar and run. No, he needs to knock over the altar, chop up the Asherah pole, create a fire, light it, then take his father's own bull and, and offer it to the true and living God. This is hard. This is requiring Gideon to face his fears. And we're told, verse 27, so Gideon took ten men of his servants and did as the Lord had told him. Gideon, who'd come to realize that the Lord is peace, begun to fear other people less, fear the nations less, and he did what God told him, even though, we're told, he was still afraid. Since he was too afraid of his family and the men of the town to do it by day, he did it by night. Gideon is moving from fear to faith. He's not all the way there, Yet he has realized that the Lord is peace and he obeys God. And sure, um, and next thing in the morning, when they rise, well, Gideon had been kind of right to be a bit of afraid of the people of the town because they rose and they were angry. They saw the altar of Baal was broken down. They asked for Gideon's life. They asked, it's Gideon, the son of Joash has done this thing. So the men of the town come to Joash, bring out your son that he may die, for he's broken down the altar of Baal and cut down the Asherah beside it. But then Joash, Gideon's father, 
who had been worshipping Baal, who'd himself set up this altar to Baal in his house. Well, God seems to change his heart. God, maybe through his son and his son's example, actually stirs in, stirs in him or does something in him. So Joash himself says to all who stood against him, will you contend for Baal or will you save him? Whoever contends for him shall be put to death by morning. If he's really a god, let him contend for himself because his altar has been broken down. Therefore on that day Gideon was called Jeroboam, that is to say, let Baal contend with him because he broke down his altar. And we're told now that as the, 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 army, the enemy army, the Midianites, come together, well, verse 34, the Spirit of the Lord clothed Gideon. He sounded the trumpet uh, and people from many of the tribes of Israel come to him. As Gideon has been moving from fear to faith, even some of his people now are following him, from fearing the nations, from worshipping Baal to following him, to answering the call of God to fight. God is bringing his servant, God is showing himself faithful as he moves him from fear to faith and he's going to use him to destroy the Midianites. Yet as Gideon comes towards this greater test, he's coming towards this battle where he's, God's been telling him he's going to defeat the, 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 tri the tribes of Midian, he's going to defeat this enemy army. Well, Gideon again has a request of God. And that's where we get the sign of the fleece in verse 36. Now, we could sometimes kind of look at this and say, oh, this is telling us about guidance or how to know God's will. But this passage isn't really about guidance or God's will. Gideon had been told exactly what to do by God several times. He knew God's will. This was about doubts. This was about whether he would trust God and fear God. Yet God, in His mercy... Well, he gave him the sign. Gideon said to God, if you'll save Israel by my hand, as you have said, even Gideon realizes, I'm only asking you to confirm what you've already told me. If you'll save Israel by my hand, as you've said, well, behold, I'm laying a fleece. And sure thing, he lay the fleece and God uh, made it wet and the ground dry. And Gideon, even that wasn't enough for Gideon. Then Gideon said to God, let not your anger burn against me. Let me speak just once more. Please let me test you just once more with the fleece. Please let it be dry this time on the fleece and let the ground be wet. Do a reverse miracle, God. And God, in his great mercy and patience, says, sure. And he does it. Then we're told, Jeroboam, that is Gideon, and all the people with him, they rose early and they encamped above the Midianites ready for this great battle. It is God is moving Gideon and his people from fear to faith. God has one more thing to do. He says, you have too many people. Verse 7, verse 2, the Lord said to Gideon, the people with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hand lest Israel boast over me, saying, my own hand saved me. It had been a miracle when Gideon called people to follow him and uh, 32,000 people, 32,000 fighters had said, we will fight. Uh, yet, we're told, now therefore, 7 verse 3, proclaim the ears of the people, saying, whoever is fearful and trembling, let him return home and hurry away from Mount Gilead. And then 22,000 of the people went home. They seemed so brave. Yes, we will fight with Gideon. God asked them, who's really afraid? And most of them said, well, to be honest, me, I'm going home. <clears throat> Even then, with 10,000 left, God said, that's too many. There's a slightly confusing way God divided them, how they drink the water, but God cut it down to 300 and said uh, that it's with these, those 300 who lap that I will save you and give the Midianites into your hand. Let all the others go, every man to his home. 
God said, you don't fear those Midianites, even though they are huge, even though they still seem like locusts, even though you can't count their camels. The Midianites have not decreased in power. Nothing has changed in their situation. Yet God has been showing Gideon and God has been showing his people that they should not fear the Midianite, that they should fear him. And when they fear him, he will fight for them. He will give the victory even with just 300 men against a countless multitude. And that same night, the night before this great battle, the Lord said to him, Arise, go down against the camp, for I've given it into your hands. But if you're afraid to go down, go down to the camp with Pura, your servant. This time Gideon doesn't ask. God just knows Gideon. He says, If you're afraid, I've got something to show you. And he takes him down to the camp and Gideon overhears two men in the camp who've had a bad dream. And uh, they're told in verse 13, um, Behold, I dreamed a dream, and behold, a cake of barley bread tumbled into the camp of Midian and came to the tent and struck it, so it it turned it upside down, so the tent lay flat. And his comrade answered, This is no other than the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. God has given into his hand Midian and all the camp. And as soon as Gideon heard the telling of the dream and its interpretation, he worshipped. And he returned to the camp of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord has given the host of Midian into your hand. And he divided the 300 men into three companies and put trumpets into the hands of all of them and empty jars with torches inside the jars and he said to them look at me do likewise when I come to the outskirts of the camp do as I do when I blow the trumpet I and all who are with me then blow the trumpets also on every side of the camp and shout for the Lord and for Gideon you can read on here you can see in the the following verses well God gives victory God uses those 300 men, but he doesn't even really use them. Verse 22, when they blew the 300 trumpets, that was the only weapon they really used at that point, the Lord set every man, all of the Midianites, swords against his comrade and against all the army. God creates confusion in this great multitude of an army and they end up slaying one another. God gives the decisive victory. God delivers his people. You can read about it in in those verses. But throughout these chapters, we've seen a God, a God who is patient and merciful, a God who is to be feared, but a God drawing people from fear to faith. So I wanted to spend a a few minutes just thinking for us how, how this passage speaks to us. Because firstly, it tells us, do not fear the world. It points to our misplaced fears. You know, the Midianites were fearsome in many ways. You couldn't count them. They really were oppressing Israel. Yet Israel shouldn't have feared them first. Israel, who'd been worshipping these uh, Baal who was meant to be a fertility god, who would give them blessing and lots of crops. How was that going for them? Well, no, they were worshipping Baal and they were not getting prosperity or, or fertility. This shows us that it wasn't the Midianites they should have feared. Uh, it, it wasn't actually his, his townspeople or his father that, that Gideon should have feared. They just needed to fear God. Because God is able to save. God's able to take 300 men, just give them some trumpets. And God is able to turn the enemy army against themselves and win the decisive victory. So God says to us, us who fear the opinion of our co-workers and our neighbours so much, we who fear the decision our boss might make or that some ruler might make so much, God speaks to us as well and says, do not fear. Those aren't the things you should fear most. There's a book out on the bookstall called When People Are Big When God Is Small. 
talking about the fear of man. And that's a misplaced fear when people seem really big and what they say and what they think controls you, makes you tremble in fear. Well, that will only happen when, well, you think God is small because God's opinion and God's power seem smaller than them. Yet God spoke to His people here and said, you shouldn't be fearing them. It's me you should fear. Reminds me of Mark chapter 2 when people bring the paralytic to Jesus. You might know the story. Uh, Some friends of a paralytic bring him to Jesus. It's so crowded, they need to dig through the roof. They lower the paralytic in front of Jesus. This man clearly has a problem. He can't walk. And Jesus says to him, son, your sins are forgiven. And I can imagine his friends saying, that's nice, Jesus, but this guy doesn't need religion. He needs to walk. Can't you see he has a real pressing problem? Yet Jesus was showing him and us that like, your greatest need is never physical. Your greatest need is never a foreign army or starvation or being able to walk. Your greatest need is in your relationship with God. He needed to be forgiven. Jesus said, do not fear those who can hurt or kill the body. Fear him who has power to throw the soul for eternity into hell. We're not to fear these things. All other things are misplaced fears. Because God is the one we should fear. Yet when we fear God... When, friend, you fear God and see that He is the one who's to be feared, we need to be on His side. When you fear Him, well, you will find that He is peace. And He says, do not fear. In verse 22, when Gideon perceived that with the angel of the Lord, Gideon said, alas, I've seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, peace be to you. Do not fear, you shall not die. So Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it, the Lord is peace. When you realise that God is the one to be feared, well, God has a way of drawing near and saying, do not fear. And it's the fact that God is to be feared that makes His word count here. You know, if a mouse says to you, do not fear, I'm on your side, I'll protect you, that's nice. But when a lion says to you, do not fear, well, the very thing that you do fear and says, that actually means something. When we see that God is the God of their heaven, that He does whatever He pleases, when, he see that he, see, when we see that our God can destroy an, an army that cannot be counted, it's like that. We see He is the one with power to send to heaven or to hell, We need to be on His side, yet when we draw near to Him in faith, our God says, do not fear, I'm with you. And we come to see the Lord is peace. Gideon says the Lord is peace, and then Gideon shows it in his life. How do you show that you've come to fear the Lord? How do you show that the Lord is peace? Well, it's not just like a cover, a wallpaper on your phone that says, hey, the Lord is peace or a nice Bible verse. It's obeying that Lord. Gideon goes on to obey, though he fears, though he struggles to to fear. What Gideon does throughout this story is at every point, even if he wants a bit of assurance, Gideon obeys. He says, yep, I'll go to my father's house and do what you told me. Yes, it seems like a terrible battle plan, but I'll send away two-thirds of my army, and then like 95% of my army, because that's what you say, God. The people had feared the other gods and not obeyed the voice of the Lord. The Lord is peace. Fear the Lord who is peace, and so trust Him that His words to you are good and true and to be obeyed. But even as we fear the God who is peace... Well, friends, trust the tenderness of God. 
Do you see how patient God was with Gideon? How gentle he was with Gideon? God slowly kind of took Gideon by the hand. He didn't take him straight from the wine vat to the battlefield. First, God sort of spoke with him, gave him some reassurance. God showed him some things. God pushed him to do the smaller thing, to confront his town and village before he went and confronted an army that could not be counted. And throughout it, even though God had given him his word, the Lord was so gracious and patient that when Gideon said, oh, your word's not quite enough, if I've really found favour in your eyes, the Lord took him by the hand and showed him, I, you really have. And Gideon said, if you'll save Israel by my hand, as you've said, well, the Lord in his grace and patience, he doesn't rebuke him, he doesn't strike him down, but he gives him, he shows him these signs. And then 7 verse 10 it has to be one of the most beautiful verses in all Scripture. When God is told, the Lord said to him, Arise, go down against the camp, I've given it into your hand, but if you are afraid. Friends, God knew Gideon. God knows us. He knows our fears as he calls us to follow him, as he calls us to trust him. He knows us. He knows our struggles. He knows our weakness. In His patience and His grace, He is tender with us. God gave this amazing reassurance. He gave it to Gideon. And this same Lord is still tender to us today. You might ask, how, how is the Lord doing this to us? How is the Lord sort of reassuring me? Well, we sung it in one of our songs earlier. What more could he say than to you he has said? If you want to know that God is really for you, if you want to know, if you trust God, that he will really do it as he has said, well, look to what he has said and look to what he is saying in the Bible. The Bible is not just an old book, some things that were written thousands of years ago. God's Word is living and active. As you come to Him, as you read your Word, this is God, your God, who knows you and loves you, who knows your weakness and knows your fear. This is your God speaking to you, taking you by the hand, saying, but if you fear, listen again to my promise, listen again to my, reass to my assurance. Friends, if you struggle to believe, you're forgiven. Again, listen again to what he's saying to you today. Romans 8.1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If you struggle to believe, you are loved. Look again to Galatians 2.20, the Son of God loved you, gave himself for you. If you struggle to believe that he's with you, look to his word that says, I will never leave you or forsake you. Look to his word. Friends, you like Gideon can look to how he's been faithful to you in your life so far. Ways he's brought you through different trials. Ways he's, he has answered prayer. Where can you look to say, yes, the Lord is peace and remember? If you're still struggling, well, no, we have something that well, Gideon didn't have in the same way. We have the Spirit dwelling in every one of us. Romans 8.16 says, the Spirit, the Spirit bears witness together with our Spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. It was outrageous for God to speak to Gideon. They're hiding in the wine vat and saying, hey, mighty man of valor. It also seems outrageous when God speaks to me or to you and says, you are my child. It's outrageous when we know the depth of our sin that God would say to us, your sin is taken away as far as the east is from the west. 
That's outrageous. That's not yet our experience. Yet our God says it to us again and again. Our God declares it to us by His Word because it's true. He wants to assure us and remind us. He might not give the signs that Gideon gave, yet he's given something greater. When Jesus' generation asked for a sign, well, Jesus had strong things to say. He said, a wicked and adulterous generation asked for a sign. No sign will be given it, except the sign of Jonah. And what's the sign of Jonah? Well, to be dead for three days and then to rise back to life. So yeah, Jesus isn't going to give us a sign. His word is enough. Except that he rose from the dead. Jesus doesn't give a sign except that this curse, this enemy that every human ever has faced, that no one has been able to beat, that he beat. He has given us the sign we need. Our tender, merciful God has shown us that he can be trusted. He continues to speak by His Word. So friends, let's follow the true God-fearer. Because the Saviour would come who would fear God perfectly without doubting. A Saviour would come who would refuse to put God to the test, even when Satan told him to, but just trusted God's Word. A Saviour would come who would stand alone against His family, He would go into his father's house and turn over the tables. The Saviour who feared and obeyed perfectly, his father perfectly. John 12, 27, Jesus said, My soul is troubled, what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose I've come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. And then a a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. Jesus is the greater Gideon. Jesus is the one who wins a victory, like Gideon did, wins a victory that brings peace and salvation, not just for the 300 who fought, or for the 22,000 who were willing to fight until they went home because they were scared. Or he wins a victory for even those who never came, who those that stayed at home. If you're one of Jesus' people, well, his victory is your victory. The peace he wins is your peace. So let's look to the true God-fearer. And as we do, finally, we can know the confidence of fearing God. At first, Gideon said, well, the Lord's forsaken us. Yet, by the end of this passage, Gideon was saying, Arise, the Lord has given the host of Midian into your hand. He'd come to fear God. And so he saw that no matter how great a victory, no matter how great an enemy, the Lord was greater, the Lord was to be feared, and the Lord could be trusted. When Gideon was first called, he said, well, please, how could I save Israel? Behold, my clan, the weakest in Manasseh, I'm the least in my father's house. For him, it was was all about him. It's like, well, I'm not strong enough, I couldn't save. But when Gideon stops fearing man and starts fearing God, well, actually, he's freed to trust in God and be confident in God, yet he's also... able to stop thinking so much about himself. By the end, he's able to say, look at me and do likewise. When I come to the outskirts of the camp, do as I do. Friends, there is a pride where you think you're great and you can do everything, but there's also a pride that says, I'm so terrible, I could never do anything because I'm not strong enough. We're both of those are pride where we need to look away from ourselves and look to God because He is the one who will give the victory. So friends, when you come to fear God, there is a confidence that God will work and even a confidence that God could use you. So friends, go out in confidence because the Lord has spoken this same word to Gideon 
that he speaks to us. Throughout history, God told Moses, do not fear, I'm with you. He told Joshua, do not fear, I'm with you, because he was working a great salvation. He told that to Gideon. He told that to Mary, do not fear, I'm with you, because God was doing something great, winning a great salvation. Jesus, uh, there in the boat, in the storm, said, it is I, do not be afraid. We know Matthew 28, Jesus told us, told His disciples, when they saw Him, they worshipped Him, but some doubted, some feared. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. I'm the one to be feared. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, teaching them to observe all I've commanded, and behold, I am with you always to the very end of the age. Friends, our God is the one who is to be feared, our God is the one who gives us peace, so let's go boldly. Let's not be afraid of our colleagues. Let's not be afraid of the world. Let's go and make Jesus known. Let's go and speak truth. Uh, Let's go and share the love of Christ. Even friends who are, are going from this place, going to places which might be harder, where you might not have a church like you have here at Redeemer. Go with boldness, go with confidence, make Jesus known because He said, I am with you and I will never leave you or forsake you. As God spoke to Paul when he was in Corinth, the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, do not be afraid but go on speaking and do not be silent, for I am with you. No one will attack you to harm you, for I I have many in this city who are my people. So friends, let's go out in the confidence of fearing the Lord. Heavenly Father, thank you that you speak to us, you are so patient with us, you are so gentle with us, So as you speak to us by your word, would you help us to believe it? That there are many things in this world that are powerful. We don't deny their power, yet you have more power. There are many things that surround us, circumstances which are hard. Lord, we trust that your power to save is greater So help us not to fear the things the world fears. Help us to look to you in fear and then to trust your saving tender voice. Do not fear. We pray in Jesus' great and good name. Amen.